Hello everyone, today we talk about the Greek slinger of the classical era um, or the Persian Wars. Actually, I, I wanted to make a video about the Greek slingers during Persian Wars. But since it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a tactical unit that really always worked more or less, more or less in the same fashion, let's say, I, I think we can address the topic in, in general for um, for the classical era, but also <coughs> practically for the Hellenistic one, we will try to stick to that. I won't go further to um, in time to to Xenophon, and um, and I haven't also made a very thorough research. <laughs> Telling the truth before making this video, um, relatively to the all the um, you know all all the accounts of of, of um, Greek or even Persian slingers because there was in in practice no um, <coughs> no great difference relatively to this um, and um, but um, this is a topic that has mm, perhaps more um, to be addressed more mm, in general fashion to be mm, effective than focusing on the s the, the singular um, military events even though th there are accounts that I found about the use of slingers tactically speaking um, and uh, the um, um <coughs> so the the idea mm, around which I would like to make <laughs> this video revolve um, is that uh, Slingers have always been used in ancient warfare. Mm. I mean, the sling is um, is probably came slightly uh, after bow, um, arrow, and spear in in prehistory, uh, but it's definitely as ancient, possibly also as those weapons. So it's something that it's pretty universal in in, in human warfare, um, and, as, and and during the ancient times it was still always uh, there. Um, <coughs> the, and the idea, however, is that during the classical period, slingers played a sort of subordinate role uh, in warfare and were of low social status. Um, the, the idea is that the... Um, first of all, we, we have a very few mm, um, information about slingers compared to other, <coughs> to other kind of troops chiefly the hoplites, also because in classical, during the classical period, basically uh, Hellenic warfare was all about um, the Oplitic phalanx. Lighter troops on, on foot or on horseback were something really m marginal, but we, we shouldn't stress, uh, overstress this, because as we will see here, there the are, um, this is just about information. Um, the, the word cultural factors made the, the Greeks um, generally speaking ignoring or, or ignoring or at least um, underestimating the um, uh, the role of the slingers and o other light troops on the battlefield and we will explain why so I think um, there are a bunch of things we can say about slings in the first place before slingers um, <coughs> themselves um, one major feature of the sling is, is is that it's a very inexpensive weapon. Mm. Uh, it was usually m built up with leather patches, uh, with strings of sinew and or gut uh, uh, attached to opposite ends. And the way it was loaded, uh, the way after it was loaded with a projectile, um, it, it was m made it spinning around. And um, basically, the throw happened when you left, you released one of the strings, and the mi missile uh, took flight. Uh, let's say, and uh, the um, the projectiles could be of different uh, fashion. There could be rounded stones that were usually the uh, the um, the heaviest bullets, essentially, and um, or it could be balls of backed clay uh, as well. Um, the <coughs> the idea is that um, as with other uh, throwing weapons, so there was essentially a uh, specialization in the type of projectile according to the target that it had to 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 impact. 
um, the heavy stones, even big as much as as a fist, so something extremely you know rocks uh, have a um, relatively high specific weight uh, usually, and they <coughs> they I if they impact at you, even if you just throw them uh, as throw um, with your arm they can do considerable damage in the first place, as we know. So with this link, there is probably even an additional capacity of throwing this. Um, but the um, this was... Um, this type of, of, of projectile was m more effective at, cl um, at short range, obviously, because being heavier, uh, it didn't have the range of smaller projectiles. Um, lead bullets, uh, you know that chemically speaking, lead has this extremely high um, absolute weight. Mm. Uh, that's the same reason why uh, why we use projectiles of uranium and all, because these ha are substances of whose atoms are um, <coughs> extremely heavy in, in mass. So even I in a small mass, you have a very heavy. Um, um, in a more uh, in a small volume, you have a very heavy mass, and this increases obviously the damaging effect when when it hits down. So lead bullets were very uh, prized, and they had a, a great a greater range. They, they were more expensive, of course, because they had to be cast and all. Even though lead, it's not as extremely heavy. And uh, by the way, uh, extremely expensive material, but um, especially these um, lead bullets were smaller. So did they, even a bunch of them, I mean, slingers could throw not for infinite time during battles, so there is also the idea of how fast they ran out of these projectiles, but they could have many, definitely. Xenophon talks about that. Um, the And they could be made of, like, a nuts or cylinders that had um, a very high degree of of um, uh, of penetration. Archaeologically speaking, we are able to date the evolution of um, sling bullets because essentially of the inscriptions that were written on it, um, and uh, and therefore from pal uh, from paleography, from the writing, we can assess you know from from which time that was was written. It's it's not an exact science, but it, it kind of helps us consistently in in, in relatively uh, uh, to that. Um, so from the classical period we have extensive um, evidence of th that such bullets were used um, and the, uh, the, the inscriptions were things very, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever watched those um, um, photographies about f from World War I, World War II, usually into which um, so, mm, uh, art artillery crews pa were, mm, I don't know, um, 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 mm, bomb, um, bomber crews uh, painted um, um, the mm, uh, things like, you know, Happy Easter, <laughs> Happy Easter, or Happy Christmas to the, the bombs that eventually have to be unloaded on on the enemy. Um, this was a similar fashion, you know, even for, from Roman times we, 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 we have fine inscriptions like take that or um, this is a gift for you <laughs> or sometimes more we also find inscriptions about the name of commanders. I think there is a, an archaeological site in Trace in today's Bulgaria that is pretty famous um, because it was apparently during the 4th century a uh, Macedonian encampment of, of, of the army of Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great, to which th there were names like Philippos in Greek that were uh, <coughs> essentially written in honor of the commander. Um, so this is just a touch of, uh, of folklore <laughs> to, to, to military history. And um, the... Um, um, the this happens still in classical uh, uh, age. The, the, there are inscriptions like um, Athens, also the, the specific city-state in the classical period, or or commanders, as we have said later, especially in the Hellenistic um, uh, age, or 
also things like ouch or pay attention just to add more because this came into my mind now um and um so the the irony in, in the tragedy of, of 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 this otherwise extremely bloody affair that classical warfare actually was um maybe not so bloody as uh, the linistic one but definitely still pr incredibly brutal and violent uh <coughs> in, ex in in really many ways um the um one of the interesting aspects though about the use of slings is um and, and especially considering the developments in military history especially compared to the bow is that slinging um is something that basically died out at a certain point i mean slinging is usually um because there is this problem here in that in in the classical um, period and in the Hellenistic one uh, even in the Roman one, th there is relatively um, th there were certain regions uh, of the ancient world, um, namely in the Greek uh, environment that we're discussing now, um, Rhodes, the island of Rhodes, and um, Acarnania. It was a relatively mountainous um, area of lot, and the idea is that the um, the sling is a typical. Uh, uh, um um uh, weapon uh in pastoral societies essentially shepherds um um that go um, essentially guarding their own cattle are supposed to to wander around and to to hunt uh, also a little bit also peasant settled you know shepherds are usually semi nomad they 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 move even in in sedentary society that there is the transhumans that make mm, shepherds let's say um, um, al always on the march so these mountaineers are usually pretty good pretty skilled also in in hunting and in and in practicing with sling because they have a lot of in the sense of let's say your free time which is not really free time because that was done probably also to 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 add consistently to their own um <coughs> resources of for survival um i say mountaineers prevalently because the uh the sling has evidently an added uh value uh, an added potential to it when there are uh, you know, on a mountain um, ter um on the mountains because of the um of the uh, essentially the difference in height uh, that allows the its projectiles to 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 with gravity to load an extra amount of energy and therefore being this extremely powerful um, projectiles in terms of penetration um, and as it can happen with a bow it's more complicated because the arrow has to essentially go straight at the enemy with its mm, point so it has to be aimed it requires all a certain equilibrium in the whole thing the sling is just um, a stone so it doesn't matter how it hits you it's just the the sheer trauma effect that it does uh, at every angle un unless <coughs> you don't have as we were saying before those lead bullets that in this sense were kind of more of a, of a more sophisticated thing per perhaps better used during pitch battles rather than in in pastoral environments i believe also because pastoral environments are on average have uh, 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 they're less powerful uh the um um then um uh, assume, um, excuse me, I lost track of what it was. I, w I was <laughs> looking at the picture of a girl here on this. Um, um, I forgot what I was saying. But um, a um, uh, so the idea, however, yeah, this is what I was saying, is that there were certain areas you know, of the ancient world that simply were specialized in 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 slinging in a certain uh, way. Unfortunately, we don't know excessive much about this because the sling and its usage is pretty universal, and there is no further archaeological or historical evidence aside from the the, the idea that there there were often Rhodian slingers uh, hired, that those populations kind of made a living um, all out of slinging uh, when they they went out of of their uh, of their homeland. Um, so the um the the idea 
um, however, is that probably for for some reason, I mean, in the case of Rhodes, uh, Rhodes is is an island in the, in the mid of the Eastern Mediterranean. It's pretty well connected to Anatolia, to Greece. So in classical warfare, it was kind of normal that um, Rhodians would venture from somewhere. I'm sure there were pretty skilled slingers in many other parts of the ancient world. But evidently there was uh, also in terms of from of request from the Hellenics or Persian systems um, uh, 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 a degree of convenience for hiring the Rhodian slingers than another slingers. So <coughs> this is what we... Um, Acarnania was a pastoral area of, um, and uh, the... Um, but otherwise it, this is true also for the Balearic Islands in in Western Mediterranean, um, but we we don't we can't really add uh, um, a lot more to this in in into in in practice. Now the 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 idea uh, is um, <coughs> I think in ancient warfare uh, slingers are uh, underestimated in the sense that um, as in other times in history, the um, the the sling is not really a it's never become, uh, unlike the bow, actually, in some populations, especially in Asia, a, a, a distinctive um, a weapon um, for, for a certain people. Uh, in Europe, um, specifically, um, the um, Aryan, um, I mean, the Indo-European, let's say, um <coughs> culture, uh, that there was a, a warlike uh, military culture, uh, yeah, <laughs> doesn't really make sense. It, it was a warlike culture in general, and it, it emphasized really the role of the single fighter as an individual at close range. So, um, uh, missile weapons throughout all this, the tribal history of Europe, and even during the chivalric times, were considered as um, essentially. Um, a, a disloyal, uh, an unfair weapon. Mm. So even in, in historical terms, it was they, they were concealed mm, because it was said, you know, this is a sort of um, um, it, um, everyone is able uh, to, to kill someone at distance without having the guts to to stand and and fight in the first place. Yes, but it still it still can kill you. So, um, <coughs> besides the uh, let's say the ideal of the niceries and all, um, we can expect and there is more than one hint that this link was used pretty extensively also by soldiers that that um, say fighters that did otherwise. Uh, today we will see how actually even the the heavy oplites, as Greek citizens, sometimes they definitely knew how to use uh, slings. Um, and even I don't know, medieval knights definitely used crossbows and bow. Um, so the the idea is um, the uh, that um, uh, is is kind of forgotten. Um, for instance, th there is an evidence in Plato uh, that t says, um, among the other things, that training with the sling was one of the um, mm, one of the skills that children had to to acquire in I uh, the ideal state of loaves, you know, all these um, political and philosophical systems. So uh, Plato d d definitely had a uh, its own classical, <laughs> evidently, um, uh, uh, let's say, mindset, still considered the sling as something that, um, you know, was was of use in, in practice. Um, the, um, uh, the um, um, relatively to other mechanical elements, let's say, of the sling, ah, uh, yes, I wanted to say that First of all, slings have to be trained. I mean, um, the fact that the sling is a pretty universal weapon doesn't mean that everyone uses it in, in, in the same way. Usually, as we were saying, this happened in the countryside, mostly in pastoralism. Um, and the um, the idea, however, is that not as n not just knowing how to throw with a sling means to be very good at throwing with a sling. So there were also differences, even in 
within certain communities, within certain traditions um, and societies that could mm, levy, evidently the, the majority of slingers weren't that good in the first place. And we know that there were many slingers in, in ancient warfare all around. Uh, <coughs> this is something that in Greece you find both during the Homeric warfare, like the, the ideal, uh, you know, so-called heroic uh, phase for which there was the individual fighter who ruled against another individual fighter, but that, that, is, always, that, that is also ideal telling the truth, uh, that there is always someone that was fighting together with the guy. And, and the lighter ones were definitely slingers who accompanied always these armies. And this sa the same goes with the, mm, the classical warfare, or the Euclidic phalanx. The Euclidic phalanx had mm, mm, skirmishers all around that kind of mm, uh, paved, uh, paved the, the, the roads to, to, the <coughs> to the phalanx advancing. And was, this was pretty normal. I mean, the slinger, as, as I was saying before, is something pretty much standard to any, let's say, pre, um, I can say pre-firearm, because during the medieval times, swimming the sling was not extremely used, but let's say it's, it was something you can find pretty much everywhere, in every society, let's say in ancient times, at least just to stick to, to our um, video's timeline today. Um, and um, uh, the the um, it, it seems that the effective range of sl of slingers, uh, um, um, according to ancient sources, was 200 meters. Mm. And the interesting thing about it is that this means that it it could um, basically outdistance the archers. Mm. So people say, w what is better, the ar uh, the bow, the sling? Well, it actually depends on what you have to do with it. But generally speaking, I think that at least in the ancient world. Slingers were pretty much more effective than than arrows, in, at least in certain in certain um, cultures, and especially the ones that had heavily, more heavily armored guys like the Greek and the Roman, the Greeks and the Romans essentially, um, um, because the bow essentially was, you know, an arrow was easily stopped by the average, at least with with a Western bow, it could be easily stopped with with by a male and uh, any form of cuirass that was being worn usually also in there we should see because the bow can be as mm, can have a very high degree of penetration some in some cases but mm, in this sense against an armored opponent the best thing you can do is to throw sling um, to throw uh, stones at him because that doesn't break armor not always at least sometimes definitely the even the heavier armor could be pierced through sling shots by uh, sling shots but the concept of the uh, of the uh, sling is to make internal trauma so that maybe the the chorus doesn't get pierced but it, it kind of um goes in and it causes uh, an internal trauma and you you uh, you have an hemorrhage and you essentially die uh, bleeding out from 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 the interior so the um these weapons were extremely extremely uh, harmful and were extremely also effective in this sense um, and um, uh, very very deep and um, the usually lattice link bullets um, I d mm, weighted something between 30 and 40 grams so uh, something very apparently very very light but definitely they could penetrate the body and, and especially were very hard to extract because uh, uh, you know the complications that it can happen. You know, uh, uh, um, uh, an arrow can ha at least has this shaft that, uh, even if it penetrates, can be extracted if you don't break the, if you don't break it by pulling it out. Um, but think of the sling, and also for the fact that the majority of the wounds at that time were not treatable uh, with. Uh, antibiotics, so people uh, practically died more of sep mm, septicemia than um, than else. Think about a, a stone that essentially enters into you in say ten centimeters. First of all, m m great part of the human body. I mean, um, if it's penetrated for ten centimeters, it basically 
means that it can cause um, major damage to, to or, uh, organs to especially the um, the um, uh, the the um, and the vessels, the, ma the major vessels, and you can bleed out. But even if it, it's, it's if it's stuck in a muscle, think about pulling it out. I mean, it's something that definitely you have to go in. You have to take it. It's not easy because the 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 the, the hit is not clean in this sense. So think about the infection that it is immediately implied. So this. Things were extremely, extremely dangerous and could make really very ha heavy, uh, heavy damage. Another thing, um, which is tell, which is told in later times by Vegetius, is that um, uh, not everybody thinks about it. That sling bullets were very fast and and and, and very hard to see. Mm. I mean, arrows can be seen approaching in a certain fashion obviously you can check you know if there are hundreds of bullets flying in the air and doing ha as it would be normal um, in, in an ancient battle at a time you you can't keep track of all of them but the slingshot is, is, is objectively um, very small the sling bullet is very small and cannot be dodged so um, it's um, it's, pr it's pretty nasty weapon definitely and and that's the reason why it's so it was so effective and why probably this indo-european societies including the Atlantic one uh that was very transformed from the tribal origins but it still owned this kind of contempt towards um the um the usage of, of the sling um the um and and the idea is that uh, even um the oplitic equipment was meant to um probably in part to stop these bullets because um the the early oplitic warfare was something pretty pretty simple uh, after all i mean it was a a, bl a wall block very thickly um compact um uh, hope lights were stuck together pretty close and all they needed was to be covered in armor and to essentially meet the enemy at the other phalanx and push in uh, uh, until one of the two didn't break. It's very similar to, to rugby in, in, in many ways. This was done not because th there was a great emphasis on the individual uh, warrior uh, as such. On the contrary, this kind of warfare was born in Greece uh, essentially to to minimize the um, the individual training, um, because the Greeks um, loathed uh, war as a professional business, uh, the whole thing of the Greek police was born in uh, opposition to the aristocratic uh, to the aristocratic society of the Bronze Age. In practice, the only who practiced war in, uh, on, on a professional base were were the Spartans practically and they were the only exception in, in Greece um, and and everybody who instead practiced warfare mm, continuously was considered in this sense a barbarian because this is what tribesmen of all, of all the rest of Europe did I mean the Greeks in this sense were an exception so they, they were kind of amateurs of war so the best way for an amateur in that sense was not to develop sophisticated tactics for which you have to train over and over again. It's just two blocks of guys who smash against each other and it's just physical brutal force that wins, not any other kind of of, um, of skill that instead is present, pre definitely present in, in the warriors of the ancient times. Let's distinguish warriors from, from soldiers because today th there is a great um, lexical confusion relatively to the idea of, w of what a warrior is in military terms and I will discuss that one day but <laughs> this is not time uh, what, I w what I wanted to say is that the um, however th that th th was uh, I, uh, this was the ideal of political battle and objectively even from a historical point of view it's very difficult to to, to find a battle that uh, an oplitic battle that really corresponds to the um, to the canonic 
um, rituals of an apolitic battle because war goes always in a different way. Every battle is different. Every uh, army is is different as well. Uh, but what we know is that aside from what the Greeks liked to write at this time, there were still pretty large um, amounts of, of of lighter troops that evidently couldn't meet hand to hand into a hand to hand combat these very heavily armored hoplites, but that uh, very well equipped oblites, but th they could hit them at the distance. So this means that the um, um, this this is part of the reason why um, especially early Greek hoplites were so heavily armored in practice. It's obviously to minimize uh, damage also from hand-to-hand -hand combat, but we know that this and and this went kind of. Um, stopping for, for um, you know, the Oplite gets lighter uh, into history. We don't have time to explain why. Uh, but let's say that part of the reason why still the, the, uh, the this kind of hev very heavy equipment was needed is that without very heavy armor, um, uh, the heaviest stones ca could, I mean, it, the, 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 the uh, sling bullets could definitely kill you before you, you reach the enemy. Um, so the mm, um, it's pretty much um, obvious that slingers had also another usage in into classical warfare because they, um, although oplitic battles occurred usually on these flat lands, these were pretty ritualized battles with m people deciding, you know, the, t the, t the enemies deciding in on which ground to meet and all. But still, I even in, 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 in the political classical warfare, there was a deal of other operations that were um, led on on, uh, on rough uh, ground uh, against other light troops, um, against light troops or even cab parts of cavalry and uh, slings in this sense were pretty useful in that in that um, uh, situation to see it is 6.22 definitely um, 6.22 definitely um, talks about this um, the uh, slingers were pretty useful definitely also in siege warfare for uh, both attacking and defending cities, they uh, they were um, they were present on ships to harass the enemy, um, the enemy ships, and uh, so th th actually we have a pretty good extensive um, uh, we have a pretty good evidence of the extensive um, use of of the sling that was really uh, done at the time in. Um, even in, in in the moment in which uh, supposedly mm, missile weapons weren't um, that widespread into the Atlantic into Atlantic warfare, um, this especially begins to change at the same end of Atlantic warfare in the sense that towards Hellenism, the majority of um, of these lighter troops started to come from. Um, from foreign countries. Mm. Originally, the Greek polis had definitely had from the surrounding countryside mm, people mm, or slaves that could be used as um, slingers. Um, for instance, the, the Greek skirmishers were usually slaves in the, in the, to the Roman mm, society. Skirmishers were Roman citizens. Um, at least in the uh, the original, um, you know, um, Roman uh, in the archaic Roman army, um, but uh, and also in the Serbian one, about which I discuss into a dedicated video. If you want to look at that, I think I discussed that. But the role of slingers in the Serbian army, that just check it out in the Roman in Roman warfare playlist. Um, we have actually other evidence of slings being used on a regular base. There is the um, Tirtaius that is describing is in describing the uh, ideal Spartan hoplite. Um, 
here we are in the mid of the seventh century and the um um the uh, the Spartans were fighting against the Messenian rebe uh, rebels and and and, and Tertius was a, was a Spartan poet um basically uh, composed uh, songs to exhort his fellow citizens to to fight well um so we there are certain fragments um that survived of this uh um of this composition um, and it gives us a pretty vivid description of, of political warfare of that time um, that definitely relied on the um, hoplite already at this time, uh, even at least, but that also means, um, that also uh, mentions, sorry, um, slings. So I will, I will read this passage. Um, Let each man stand firm with his fleet uh, with his feet set apart, facing up to the enemy and biting his lip, covering his thighs and sh uh, sh shins, I believe it is in English, his chest and shoulders with the wide expanse of his shield. Let him shake his spear bravely with his right hand, his helmet's crest nodding fiercely above his head. Let him learn his warfare in the heat of battle and not stand back to shield himself from missiles, but let him move in close, using his spear or sword to strike his enemy down. Place feet against the enemy's feet, press shield against shield, not helmet against helmet, uh, so that the, crest are in t uh, the crests are entangled and then fight your men standing chest to chest, your long spear or your sword in your hand. And then it says, And you, the light-armed man, hiding behind the shields, launch your sling stones and javelins at them, giving good support to heavy infantry. So he, 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 this, um, uh, this fragment is very fascinating because it's basically... Um, uh, it's not just praising hoplites, but it's substantially um, saying that is in in this ideal picture of how um, a politic um, battle should be. Definitely, uh, the uh, the slingers and the javeliners had to uh, support the heavy infantry. It's also interesting in here that uh, um, there are no bowmen, which stresses probably the fact that sling stones in this sense were pretty. Um, pretty useful in oplitic warfare considering the, the heaviness of the oplitic um, armor that required sling stones rather than, than arrows to take the hoplite uh, down. The, um, there is a similar um, passage from Xenophon uh, in, in a much later time. Xenophon lived between the uh, the the end of f uh, of the fifth and beginning of fourth century BC, um, and, and Greek warfare was really changing much uh, at that time, but it still relied on the oplitic tactics, um, and the um, this is already in, into the fourth century. Um, the um, the um, Xenophon basically is waxing eloquent on the beauty of a well-organized army. So th there is this is a recurrent um, topos we can say um, in in Greek literature relatively to military affairs. Uh, there, there is definitely the exaltation, the, the praising of the political warfare as the um, the best warfare that existed I from an Hellenic mind. Uh, Xenophon was was pretty borderline into this. He was already much uh, Hellenistic in mind, but uh, at the time um, um, the the evolution towards the the Hellenic phalanx and Hellenistic phalanx from the Greek from the Hellenic Hellenic one was was still uh, was had yet to come, yet. Uh, here it's basically writing the same thing, and it's interesting. He says, I mean, who, if he is not on the same side, could fail to be delighted at the sight of, of mass and whole flights marching in formation, or to admire cavalry riding in, in ranks? And who, if he is all, uh, on the other side, could fail to be terrified at the sight of whole flights, cavalry, peltasts, 
archers, slingers all arranged and following their commanders in a disciplined way. So this is interesting compared to Tirtaius because to the times of Tirtaius because you notice here that together with the hoplites there aren't just um, javeliners and slingers but also cavalry and archers so the pool of the troops here has really expanded the Greeks were um, increasingly more involved abroad and they uh, began to hire uh, foreign mercenaries the Thracian peltists were quite praised cavalry was also raised in a certain a measure and even these lighter troops in general even slingers and archers were drawn from from other uh, from non-Hellenic uh, uh, people, e essentially. Um, so also in here, um, you you understand uh, that the slingers were were s well always there in in practice. The um, the um, relatively to this, and talking specifically about the um i wanted to say because i have here selected first of all i wanted to say relatively to, to the last point that um these peltasts archers and slingers uh, were starting to be increasingly um uh uh, let's say more highly trained mm -hmm. because in the um, Hellenic modern land it is true that there were populations as we've seen that were kind of specializing in, in slaying warfare but uh, let's say that the more the, the, the Greeks expanded outside of Greece they met with es essentially tribal populations that really were much more mm, uh, warlike and and they they spent most of their times really uh, fighting. So individually speaking, they had a great a, a greater um, skill in in weaponry uh, use. So this means that the Greeks, when hiring mercenaries, they were trying to obviously to pick up the the best ones. While uh, the Greek motherland was in growing increasingly more civilized, the the individual cities were definitely also trying to disarm the countryside because for obvious reasons of control etc so it was uh, um, maybe I at the origins of the Greek polis there were more skilled this is my speculation more skilled slingers than they came to be later so this was aside from the political and military uh, events that brought the Greeks to expand outside of the motherland um, with military expeditions is, is that they also needed um, um, increasingly these mercenaries that uh, that in this sense they could hire and then when they, they were done they could really let them um, were, were outside of Greece <laughs> so not creating anything social like a body of professional soldiers into Greece that was definitely something politically uh, socially um, completely um, uh, um, incompatible, irreconcilable with um, with Hellenic with the Hellenic mind, uh, because those were conceived as barbarians, mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is also important. Uh, we have um, from these times we have. Okay, let's do this in scattered without chronological times or let's just let's try to do something. Um to see this mm -hmm. writes that um um Uh, Thucydides was essentially writing that the uh, stone throwers, lingers, and archers uh, were were unimportant, mm -hmm. um, and this is um, this is a bit of a uh, um, um, of a sort of uh, as we were saying before, a sort of um, attempt of diminishing the importance of these troops. Actually, 
uh, he, com he also commented on the uh, 120 Athenian hoplites that perished at the ends of Aetolian javeliners. Aetolia is um, a region in northwestern Greece that in this sense was a um, bit borderline. I mean, the, the Greeks from Attica and Peloponnesus were a bit posh um, towards uh, the, the northern Greeks that were considered sort of uh, barbarians or half Greeks, not even Greek like the Boeotian Bo that were considered sort of beasts or the Aetolians that were in this sense. And because those were areas into which um, the polis had developed uh, less than in, say, in Attica with Athens, uh, Athens or, or Sparta in the Peloponnese. Um, so you see that the Aetolians in this case uh, had uh, killed um, just through with javelins 120 uh, Athenian hoplites. This, these uh, were things that were starting essentially to happen when um, when the the Oplitic armies began to venture outside the Hellenic motherland. Many people believe um, erroneously that the Greeks um, exported their phalanx warfare everywhere around the Mediterranean. This is actually false. Um, the Greek Oplitic, um, the Oplitic classical warfare is something that basically was um, confined exclusively to within the boundaries of the Greek motherland um, for many reasons that are mostly political and social because even the Greek polis is something that is born there that is not born elsewhere. All uh, You say, well, yeah, but the Greeks founded many other polis around the Mediterranean. This is true. But these polis, polis grow to be something completely different from uh, the ones of the motherland. They had a completely different society. The Oplitic phalanx in there was created because these were Greek settlers that brought that from, from their motherland but, but motherland, but both for environmental reasons, for the different enemies that they had to face, for the... Um, even different battlefields, the different grounds, the different, um, even the different social dynamics and economical dynamics. Basically, the Oplitic phalanx in, in, in the um, Hellenic colonies soon de decayed and decline, declined. As such, then it evolved in something different, um, in mostly the so called Hellenistic warfare. If you take Syracuse, for instance, it was a, uh, a Greek colony or Taras, there was a Spartan colony, uh, mm, uh, were actually mm, pretty, uh, they were pretty powerful cities, but they, they gave up essentially the Oplitic phalanx as such. They began to fight using mercenaries, and using uh, picked bodies of, um, of citizens, and trying to specialize, because um, that was a well, uh, well, uh, well another uh, environment. and. The Oplitic phalanx didn't work outside Greece, and one of the major uh, reasons why it didn't is that um, that it had I it was not able to adapt uh, in its all infantry, um, thickly packed, ha um, heavy formation to the diversity that warfare presents uh, all around. So in the case of the, the Thucydides is, is describing of the 120 uh, Athenians, uh, Athenian hoplites slaughtered by javelins, this happened also to the Spartans many times. It, that um, it proved that practically um, the phalanx couldn't fight by keeping excluding other uh, tactical um, uh, specializations aside from the heavy infantry that the phalanx represented because it didn't have support and it could end up to be uh, mm, mm, exterminated just by a bunch of, of guys who were throwing project missiles at them. So the, the idea here is that Thucydides is, is um, obviously a um, sort of, um, uh, um, of a... Um, uh, he was definitely also a military man, so he, he knew what he was talking about, wi but he, he was pretty much um, a sort of... Uh, uh, um, uh, I don't know how you say that. Uh, mm, 
uh, a conservative uh, from from in terms of military culture. He understood. He he was reasoning essentially in the um, at the acme of the oplitic um, glory, let's say, uh, in terms of you know especially not much the because uh, at his times. Um, a political warfare was already changing, but it was the the moment of great uh, of greater um, glory of Greece, even of with the terrible mm, wars that were occurring through b uh, among the Greeks and all. So it was a moment of great insight, actually, into into the and, and, uh, and of criticism too, um, relatively to the to the. Hellenic political and social system, but at the same time, the Greeks were still in love with their own um, ideal warfare, and they couldn't conceive sometimes that things like the extermination of of, of hoplites at the hands of a bunch of joviners was something um, you know possible, or that uh, at least it was mm, um, um, very um, very bitterly remarked uh, as uh, as a very unusual inconvenience, but things had to 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 change um, uh, uh, eventually. Um, the um, the um, uh, however the importance on uh, of um, of slings um, into warfare um, into Classical warfare had definitely been important during the Persian Wars. Um, the, um, the there had been occasions into which the um, the Greek um, phalanx had been targeted by uh, enemy uh, by Persian slingers. Now the Persians made uh, as any other uh, army of the time, as we have heard. Uh, extensive use of um, of slingers of, of lighter skirmishing troops. Um, the Persians actually had a, m a much more highly advanced um, military culture than the Greeks. I mean, the Greeks were um, specialized in this kind of. Um, they had essentially one one uh, one thing: their heavy infantry. It was all about it. Um, and and they won the um, the uh, the Persian wars thanks uh, to the Oplitic phalanx, but definitely the Persians were much more articulated uh, in their uh, uh, military organization. They knew how to use. I mean, the idea that the Persians were poorly disciplined is is rubbish. We know that the Persians had a degree of training that the Greeks were already dreaming of in terms of of uh, of um, of maneuvering of collective um, formations collective training and all so the, uh, the 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 greek phalanx in this sense was uh, telling the truth the only thing that the persians really lacked the persians had their own heavy infantry but they were usually small in number they they us they preferred to have this um, uh, they didn't have this body of thickly compact uh, formations all covered in, in in metal like the Greeks had. Um, they were usually lighter, but they had equally m deadly, uh, other deadly uh, troops that were basically the, the whole range of possibilities for the ancient world. Um, this is being seen actually uh, as as a recurring thing in terms of, of West and East meeting like even in the modern age, the the European uh, infantry of mm, pike and, and 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 musket were what essentially the Ottomans lacked. The Ottomans were advanced in everything um, more than the Europeans, but the Europeans had. I mean, not really more than the Europeans, but the Ottomans it was a bit different. Uh, even if with the Persians, it, it isn't really true. But just for saying that. Um, in military affairs, you can have a pretty evenly matched um, situation, even if you have an extremely sophisticated army, and, they are in, and your enemy has a, a one, a essentially a one-arm um, army. Like it could be with infantry, with uh, infantry with the um, with the inopolitic warfare. 
Um, however, the um, having this uh, single arm um, tactical system, it also implies that at a certain point there is uh, an evident um, weakness that you have. The one of the, the oplitic phalanx was definitely uh, mobility. Mm. The real, the, the really, the real big problem of oplitic phalanxes was that in order to preserve their um, their order, to to keep their formation intact, they were usually slow. So uh, if you are a Persian uh, a king, let's say, and and an obedience that can happen to anyone, let's say, um, and and you have lots of of of, of, of pretty good skirmishers. Um, the first thing you want to do is to to harass the the Greek uh, politic formation uh, and wear it down essentially, and then uh, attacking it. It's it's not um, automatic that you're gonna win. As a matter of fact. Um, a very important thing I haven't said up to now is that uh, these skirmishers, um, we mentioned before the, the case of the 120 Athenians slaughtered, um, it happened also to, to the Spartans at one point, uh, but those are exceptions. Let's say that in pitched battles, especially or in battles in which there is not a great, um, mm, let's say, a disparity of forces, um, skirmishers, uh, and this remains for, for all the ancient world and even the medieval one, uh, and even in contemporary times, let's say lighter troops, uh, are not able to to take out essentially the, the heavier ones. Mm. You could have as many as uh, um, as many skirmishers as you want, um, but uh, first of all and that they will not be able to take down the wall enemy uh, formation. First of all, uh, even from a strategical point of view, it's not um, um, a great logistical uh, choice to, to fill your ranks with, with lots of people that have to eat and drink and, and yet they can on, what, what they can only do, like anyone else, and what they can only do is to, to skirmish. Because uh, your supplies are gonna be uh, you know, keeping up, uh, keeping maintaining, um, up keeping um, uh, an oplitic phalanx is already something pretty expensive on its own, and and the Greek police invested into that because they knew that that was the the most convenient thing to do, adding up to the um, uh, to the supplies and resources by adding this uh, masses of 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 light uh, keep troops was kind of um, does really didn't make sense. Plus, these light troops, uh, if they are in, in excessive number, they will also be pretty um, exposed on the battlefield. I mean, first of all, they, they, they're not meant to meet the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So uh, as soon as the enemy approaches, they will flee in any case. They can definitely support the heavy phalanx, but if there are too many, first of all, they can become... They can, mm, they create problems in terms of maneuvering because if you fill the battlefield with all these guys, it's even difficult. The, the battlefield I is already chaotic the way it is normally um, in, in a classical um, in classical warfare. If you add this um, scattered uh, from you know these um, all these guys that ran around, they're not in a formation. They all scatter around. It. You're already only causing uh, further problems. Plus the enemy, y if you if you have only an oplitic phalanx, you cannot defend these guys. You can't stretch out because otherwise your phalanx will be annihilated immediately um, to protect these guys. So these guys will also quite they would also be a quite a quite of an easy uh, easy um, prey for the enemy. Secondly, and and this is very important, what people mm, tend to forget in this theoretical. Um, Discussions is that the um, um, the battlefield uh, is not this flat ground with nothing on it. I mean, you don't have all the space that you want. You don't have all the space for maneuvering. Uh, actually, if you have an oplitic phalanx, all you care about is to have your your flanks protected. So you you would deploy that in, in um, on a terrain w that is essentially uh, close at the phalanx side, so even for maneuvering certain troops, like um, putting all these skirmishers in the front and maybe mm, having uh, the enemy attacking and needing these guys to, to flee, 
with, uh, within the ranks. I mean, if there are too many, they simply don't have space to maneuver. Even with their sheer number, they can mess up uh, in their retreats the, the, the phalanx. Um, uh, they won't ha necessarily have even space from um, behind and in the flanks to, to skirmish effectively. So, um, uh, these are all the reasons why you the 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 light troops were not used in excessive numbers in these armies and while um, um, also for the sake of spatial problems um, the a ancient armies relied on these thickly packed formations of infantrymen more or less um, uh, more or less armored in the case of the Greeks definitely uh, more <laughs> definitely um, uh, more armored than than else. So, uh, what I'm trying to say in here is that um, mm, we attributed to the Greeks this mm, kind of um, contempt for lighter troops, but objectively, and and, and we s suspect that the, these lighter troops were actually more um, um, more important, tactically speaking, than what the the classical sources suggest. But it is still true that they they weren't uh, decisive. I mean, they weren't troops that uh, that um, that won battles. They were troops that could maybe surround an isolated body of infantrymen if they were lucky in taking them down. But in pitched battles, you don't win uh, with those. Um, and and what you can hope to do with those is really to to take uh, to to actually um, destroy the uh, the order of the enemy ranks more than anything, because this is what it gets down to. I mean, it's not really about taking out the enemy physically. It's really disordering the formation. Because even if you take out one guy in a formation, um, the wall formation works in a fashion for which if you take that guy out, that guy in the front, the guy in the back is usually a little worse, so he will have to, to go to, to fill that gap, and he's not used to be immediately in the first line, he was used to follow the guy in the front. So th if this starts happening w with several people that eventually um, need to, to fill gaps and to mess up the formation, th the wall formation will lose um, uh, um, will lose um, um, the, um, uh, the, the compactness. Mm? Uh, so um, the unit will will not work properly, and it will be easier to be um, to be scared, to to waver, and, and eventually to flee. This is how the wolf egg was actually conceived. Um, if you look at what happened in the Battle of Marathon, uh, uh, which is an extraordinary battle in into um, not just from a let's say strategical point of view, because. Um, uh, the 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 Battle of Marathon uh, I I it's a, a really a, 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 a watershed in, in into history. 409 BC, they, um, uh, they they it was a decisive Greek victory that um, uh, the that that halted the uh, the culmination of the Persian uh, offense into 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 Greek. Um, it's really a turning point. But w what is very fascinating about it is also what the Greeks were able to do on that battlefield, because um, the, the great problem here is that, first of all, the Greeks were quite lucky because th there was no Persian cavalry around, so um, they were essentially facing the uh, Persian army, and uh, they had to advance the, the against uh, against them. The problem is, th or, or maybe letting them come, the problem was that the, the, the Persians had an extensive um quantity of archers, slingers, and jaliners that uh that would have uh, really worn out the Greek um um compactness um and destroyed Greek compactness if the the Greek phalanx had advanced at the usual pace. So what happens uh, at Maradon is something incredible in in, in uh Oplitic warfare uh, in classical pre-warfare, that is the the charge of the Greek hoplites, who incredibly managed to keep their formation, keep up their formation, 
uh, at least enough to reach the enemy and the Persian infantry was lighter into um, and to rout it in practice. Um, after some fight, which definitely did occur, um, but that was something that probably the Persians didn't expect, because they said, you know, the Greek phalanxes are, are notoriously slow. They can't ad advance at a, at, a, at a fast pace, because they will break their formation. Instead, the Greeks, we don't know how they made it. Uh, and the reason was that they had gone slow, more slow, um, uh, slower, let's say, uh, they would have been disordered um, 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 in a, um, in a, uh, in a, 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 a irreparable fashion for their formation to hold in the subsequent melee. Um, instead they ran, they avoided therefore all these projectiles arriving at them and they, they won battle thanks to that. Then eventually they screw up things because they <laughs> when pursuing the, the enemy the, the, the Persians, they, they broke the phalanx instead and when they reached the uh, the Persian um, fleet on the shore where the Persians were uh, regrouping, they, they suffered a, a very high um, number of casualties against the same enemies that they had routed, simply because they had um, broken their formation. They won battle anyway, but, but it was also very bloody for the Greeks, so you can see here the mistake, even I in after, you know, the, uh, the definitely the excitement that, that surely they, they had had after they, they had managed to avoid, let's say, the, uh, the missile rain that the Persians were um, throwing at them by sticking together uh, while running, it was a pretty amazing fit, and then breaking for, you know, this, even think about how nervous they were, so psychological um, things were uh, definitely important, so th the Battle of Marathon in this sense shows that the Greeks were pretty much aware of what very good skirmishers like the, um, the ones the Persians had uh, could uh, could uh, achieve against uh, their um, their ranks. Um, th there is also a later um, account of Xenophon uh, from the Anabasis uh, 4321, into which um, the into which Xen Xenophon ordered his men to double um, when the first link stones uh, began to rattle against their shields. So even at this point, uh, the the, uh, the Atlantic phalanx um, was starting to become more dynamic. But um, at the same time, here you see that the commander, uh, the Greek commander, um, feels the need to 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 speed up, because if if the, the phalanx had sustained other other casualties, other hits from 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 these links and the, the other projectiles, it, it might have. Uh, um, irreparably lost its cohesion and, and they would have been defeated. Um, th there are, however, other passages into which the um, um, into which uh, the same Xenophon from the Ana uh, Anabasis 3 uh, 1 uh, to 3 18 um, where um, uh, the, the, mm, where it said the Persian archers and slingers were not able to overwhelm the Greeks during their lo long march up to the Tigris, mm -hmm. which, I which evidently the Persians were trying to do to wear them out. This is also very interesting because it proves that guerrilla warfare, skirmishing, is not always the best thing. Just recently I was discussing about this relatively to crusader warfare and the, the use of horse archers, light uh, uh, skirmishers from the Muslim side against the heavy um, uh, Western cavalry, and the point is that Western cavalry often ha often had the better hand on them. I mean, there is this um, Western def uh, defeatism um, that I don't know why. Maybe because of the Vietnam War and all the things. Uh, the Westerners cannot win against guerrilla. This is absolutely false. <laughs> the Westerners have won actually most of the times against guerrilla with their heavier troops and. Um, so, and th this passage from Xenophon is um, uh, uh, really, really proves it in, in, in substance. I mean, 
definitely if if you are uh, if you are a, a heavy uh, um, you know if you are heavy and you move move slowly you can definitely be attacked i mean it, it, it um worn out in that fashion i mean it's not something that automatically fails or doesn't fail it all depends on the situation but it's still feasible i mean um as you fear to be worn out by the enemy the enemy fears not to be able to to wear you out so that's the real point i mean that warfare I it's not something mechanical that uh, you know th there is a tactics yeah it, it wins all the times it really depends on the situation and on a myriad of factors of attrition that um you can't really um frame into a you know uh a preset picture uh, for which you know what is going to happen on the field because this has never <laughs> happened and the guy i i um i use um as an avatar uh, really wrote extensively about this so never uh, simplify warfare. Never think that it's uh, that one way goes. Uh, th that things have to go that way because uh, there are general rules. Everything can really um, go in an our fashion. Uh, keeping to quote Xenophon on that uh, on that part. Um, um, I think this, the, mm, yeah, the, the here it's the Persians, according to Xenophon, the Persians uh, had a raiding party of about 600 men that failed to surprise uh, the Greeks. Um, 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 no, wait, um, these were the Greeks actually, sorry, uh, my mistake. The Greeks were about to raid a uh, countryside that basically rose against them. Um, and the, um, the this is very interesting. It says that the Greeks managed to retreat by keeping a circular formation, mm, which shields turned to the enemy arrows and slings. This is a v also a very interesting uh, quote because we have a similar. I think only uh, only uh, one account in Roman warfare that happened exactly the same. The Roman called the circular formation the orbis. Mm. Um, like the the world basically because that was and and it's very interesting because they they equally retreated with that for me in that formation so covering like a, a, a round formation that m moves uh, in retreat so fencing off the enemy attacks this is something you find even in 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 other more modern uh, occasions like uh, the famous um, square of aiding um, of um, uh, of um, 18th century warfare, let's say, uh, at the battle of, I think of the battle of Anspern uh, or of Vienna, I don't remember, there was a Saxon battalion uh, of the Prussian army that uh, retreated in square formations, fencing off the enemy attacks. So many times in history you find that um, even though you're slow, because uh, even in the case of Xenophon here, we're talking about heavy infantry. Even in the case of the Romans, we're talking about the legionary heavy infantry and, and all. Even if there is an enemy harassing you, you can still fence it off. And it's interesting that Xenophon quotes, um, the, um, tells these stories relatively to uh, the Anabasis and to these um, slingers that harass the Oplitic formation, because it actually proves how the Oplitic formation could, uh, especially in, in those times where professionalism was kicking in from the amateurialism of the uh, golden age of of, of, uh, of of the polis, let's say, uh, was able, mm, implied that the Fox was growing increasingly capable even of dealing with this um, um, with these threats, essentially the skirmishers. Um, there is, however, one occasion into which the um, the hope lights were um, uh, irreparably uh, exposed, and that uh, were definitely the nightmare of every hope light. That was the uh, crossing of mountain passes, because in, on that occasion, uh, the the mountain pass. I, 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 the reason of this is the mountain pass is very thin; it's very narrow, so um, the whole the, the phalanx cannot pass through that. In in as a formation, and the the hoplites have to 
go uh, scattered in 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 uh, in a file, essentially uh, percurring. Uh, I mean, going through the trail. Mm -hmm. So at that point, not being a faked compact formation, they can be easily taken down. They, they have no guys that are protecting them at the sides or in the back. So uh, a slinger, a javeliner. Um, could quite easily attack and kill the whole blight. This is, by the way, how the same Greeks at a point began to develop javeliners, because Greece is a pretty heavily mountain terrain. So when, um, from the Pel Peloponnesian War, uh, especially onwards, the Greeks began to... Mm, Greek warfare um, mm, mm, exceeds seasonalism, and basically the, the Greek armies are have a, an increasingly uh, strategical uh, range of distance and they pass even through mountains into Greece. It, it's not always you know, the, the, the provincial scale warfare but something greater uh, on a, at a regional scale. Um, Hoplites had to pass through these passes so one way to, to defend them, the Athenians did them because in order to reach Athens there were lots of passes to, to cross from the north. The idea was, uh, let's create bodies of peltasts, of more lightly equipped troops that can, in this sense, protect better our passes. Um, so, the, in, in Xenophon's Anabasis and Elenica, we hear of, 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 of a number of such incidents, um, in, in essentially to which uh, hoplite armies were ambushed in mountain passes. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were desperate uh, for archers and slingers to beat back attackers. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, the definitely climbing rugged mountain paths in full armor, especially in summer, uh, while under attack, was the Hoplite's worst nightmare for sure. And, um, and, um, and 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 this is uh, interesting because um, th there were also other evidences where there was there was a rough ground um, into which um, this is told. I think I don't remember the quote now, but it's uh, from Xenophon's and an Abbasis that the Greeks were advancing against an enemy that was up mm, over a hill or a mountain, and and the, the ground was pretty um, pretty uneven. So the problem was this, is that if the Greeks had reached the enemy, um, um, I don't remember if they were throwing things at, probably um, yes. So it was impossible to keep the phalanx unity on that, um, on that ground. So Xenophon ordered the phalanx to split into so a, so a series of columns and to charge through columns. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that could happen only at the time of the Anabasis, like 6th century Oplitic armies couldn't really achieve something like this because they weren't professionals. Um, but the, the, the in that case Xenophon made it because basically those columns could easily pass through the narrow um, um, mountain trails and they managed to engage as an assault force the enemies uh, and to win even. Um, so um, this was, I think, chiefly done still for because of the the really devastating effect that a slingshots could have in part. At least it, it's one of the, the causes that, and, and probably not a, a, a secondary one. Why? Um, well, the Greeks uh, were obliged to keep transforming their armies when going abroad. Mm. Um, However, there was still a prejudice towards slingers in absolute terms. We've seen that Xenophon actually praised, uh, in part, the um, uh, the, mm, the, mm, the slingers as as um, as the Caius, as as a sort of natural element into oplitic warfare. Doesn't matter how secondary. Um, and um, the and and however, there was a sort of s of of, sa of social stigma attached to these slingers because we have said, as we've said, in, in Greece, these guys were mostly slaves or people who weren't really um, civilized as the um, uh, ideal um, citizen. And the, mm, of the polis was conceived uh, according to Hellenic culture that was elitary at this time because still 
and the, the, the Greeks could be, let's say, democratic this time, but the, the sources that are written are mostly sources from the still the wealthier guys of the polis. So there was a lot of mm, being, you know, a bit um, a bit posh towards these um, people. But the problem is also that when the Greeks began to recruit uh, slingers from from other populations, these first of all were barbarians, so they were loathed because of that. And Xenophon actually calls the slingers the most slavish, slavish of all soldiers, uh, because he said, since no number of slingers alone could stand up against even a few hoplites. Hmm. Well, this um, this is probably a. Um, I mean, I don't believe the guy. <laughs> I believe him in the sense that, as we have said, um, um, it took definitely many skirmishers to, to take out even a few heavily armored oplites. But I still could do that in theory. So it probably here the, the contempt toward the slinger is something that goes a bit beyond even the tactical measurement of the wall of the mm, of the four of forces. Um, 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 let's say that um, um, at that time uh, it was probably their social status that made them um, um, poorly regarded. Mm. Um, slings were cheap to make. Were these were, generally speaking, already poor people on their own. So um, even if other components of the army were still dependent on uh, the one on the other, slings were seen as the, the, like the lowest kind of form of fighter that, that, that was uh, substantially out there. Um, even in in numeric works, there there is uh, um, there is a sort of contempt. Um, probably I in in numeric sources, if I'm not wrong, peltasts and archers are much more prominent than slingers. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I, I should check this. But um, even in here, it could be that maybe archery or javelin throwing was considered for certain reasons probably a bit better than throwing with the sling. Um, considered that in the Greeks were also pretty uh, attracted, fascinated by the shitsins that were barbarians from, from their perspective, but were still appreciated for their military skills. So the, the bow um, the Greeks also went into Crimea, you know, pretty close to the Greeks in terms of, uh, to the Shitsin in terms of colonization. They had began to prize the, the effect of the arch of, of the bow because in, in those nomadic cultures that was attached also to nobility, so it was a sort of noble uh, weapon. So the Greeks were impressed and probably partially integrated this um, Shitsin influences. We know, we know that also from the Greek um, uh, mythology and um, and um, and th and the theater and all you know and also certain cults that were brought from Shitsia and implied. If you think uh, Artemis was uh, using a bow, so uh, even javelin throwing was something that probably belonged to the ideal ancient tribal warfare of the warrior that could fight with the spear, but as as well throw in that. The slinger instead had always been the guy behind all the others, like Tertius was saying, behind the, the shields of the others, and that was like the lighter form, the the, the lower f social form of, of of character that could happen to to exist on, on on an ancient battle. So that's probably why also slingers were so um, depreciated, and why we don't get an extensive knowledge about their uh, their employment uh, into into. Uh, warfare. I, al although we know that from a certain point, very good slingers were very highly praised. Like it happened for with the Rhodes, uh, with the Rhodian slingers. Even the, the the Romans were pretty keen with the with the Balearic slingers. And also, um, uh, the there is still evidence that slingers were very very important. Um, 
um, consider, by the way, that um, this attraction for the bow uh, over the sling is that also because the Persians made extensive use of Shitic um, um, uh, populations, you know? but the Persians had lots of horse archers, and and horse archering was one of the uh, activities of the Persian nobility for hunting and all. So even in there, probably the bow was still seen from a Greek perspective when also when when they met with the Persians, um, something to to be to respect. Mm? While the sling was still the the shepherd's weapon, mm? so I, I I like to stress this this point uh, to explain a bit. Um, um, however, um, I uh, I didn't talk much about the tactical deployment of slingers in here. Um, the I will conclude by simply saying that the slinger could operate really at every side of the formation if there was the chance for the physical space for doing that. Some of that were also probably scattered among the ranks, ranks um, uh, or and they could run uh, within them. Um, even in fact, if the um, the, Gle and the Greek phalanx was pretty uh, compact, um, it could happen during the battle that some gaps opened, or at least that there were gaps between uh, units of hoplites, like it's present in any army. So the sling can evidently run. Um, it, it doesn't have a rank on its own. It, it, it's fr he's free. He's simply running back and forth. So and it's what he can do best. So it would be obvious to mm, to see this um, even in later warfare. This um, orderly blocks of of um, of heavy infantry uh, marching together and a, a myriad of these guys running back and forth in front um, of their ranks and uh, and then back into uh, behind them and on the flanks and all. Um, and sometimes they could even obviously being left on their own. I mean, if there is a heavily mounted, um, uh, um, a, a tough ground that is difficult to reach for cavalry or for heavy infantry, definitely slingers could be put without cover in there, like sharpshooters. By the way, slingers were used as sharpshooters. We have evidence of this in especially in Hellenistic warfare, but this probably happened already before because the sling is also pretty precise in, in many ways, and especially uh, this is, um, you know, slinger, uh, slings are pretty damn good against cavalry. Uh, there wasn't a great deal of cavalry in, in a plague warfare, but definitely in Hellenistic times, if you really um, managed to spot the, the general's bodyguard, uh, the enemy general's bodyguard, you could definitely throw lots of um, <laughs> stones at that trying to, to kill the guy and uh, impacting again. And, and, and the sling, the sling bullet, as we have said, was the best uh, mm, projectile to do that because it could kill the horse that is a big target and usually unarmored. Um, it can... Um, and if the if the general falls from the horse, even if it's not killed, and pe it might be that the the army uh, panics because it doesn't see the guy anymore standing on on a horse, then usually the the generals were very heavily armored, so the best kind of, of weapon to to hit them was uh, a tra a blunt one like the sling bullet. Um, so this was a way also they were used, and you will see that, especially in Hellenistic warfare, not still in classical athletic warfare. And this is pretty much it. <laughs> I didn't think I, I would talk so much about about this topic, but I think it's very interesting because, among the other things, um, it's very, very important to understand what was the role of slingers. Um, today we, we approached also a little bit the uh, Greek hopolitic warfare that I haven't maybe some of the uh, the the adjectives I'm using um, I didn't give an explanation for them like it's important to distinguish um, uh, Hel the Hellenistic phalanx from the classical phalanx um, sometimes I say Hellenic instead of Greek and vice versa sometimes I said uh, I say the whole plight as, um, but uh, even the the, the Hellenic uh, classical Hellenic phalanx had its own changes during uh, during the centuries. So, I will definitely talk about political warfare in the future. Today was 
chiefly um, um, I, I wanted to chiefly explain more or less what 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 were slings in at the times of classical warfare from the Atlantic perspective mm, and oblitic warfare that uh, that was the, the main thing uh, at the time. Oh, mm, I know it, this maybe <laughs> this explanation is even maybe more confusing than else, but I promise I will give more explanations in the future. Uh, for now, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Um, I, if you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if, to, if you're interested to, to see more of my videos uh, that will come in the future. And for now, I thank you um, heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!